Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you here, and thank you very much for the invitation. As Barbara mentioned, I'm an alumna of GFS, Germantown Friends School, so I'm really excited to see that um, the, the uh, collegiality of, of faculty and leadership administrators, students from the independent schools ecosystem are gathering to um, do a deep dive on the role of creativity and collaboration and the way you're, you're fusing technology into the way you're teaching. So I decided to title what I'm talking about to this morning, Creative Ground. I think it's very important to embrace this idea of creativity and I have some ideas that I want to share with you about how I unpack creativity and I'm going to tap into a few examples from my own life to illustrate these ideas and I hope it will get you thinking about how you can integrate it into your practice and into your teaching. So I want to start with this question. What is the future of work? And this is a question that I've actually spent quite a bit of time thinking about. When I, um, as Barbara also mentioned, I am the founding director of the Strategic Design MBA program at Philadelphia University. We're not an MBA for designers. And actually one of your uh, colleagues, I don't believe he's here this morning, but he's one of my, my newest students, Jason Segern, is the middle school director of Delaware Valley Friends School, and Jason is a member of the fourth cohort of the SD MBA program. So what we do in this program is we integrate design thinking and systems thinking into the way we teach MBA content in a non-traditional way. So we try to do these study abroad uh, jaunts in the program and um, we've done two, we've been around for two years. And two years ago we went to Helsinki, Finland where my graduate students uh, did a design research project on the future of work. But in order to think about the future of work, we've got to think about the educational landscape. And in my view, a tsunami has hit uh, education as a sector, as an industry, and I definitely feel it in the higher ed sector. And some of those disruptors that are contributing to the tsunami effect are platforms like Khan Academy, Wikipedia, MOOCs, massive online open courses, uh, Coursera, edX, so where the value proposition in education, in particular in higher ed, has been in our intellectual capital, in the faculty, in the library, these are great examples of new ways that students are finding to learn and to teach. So for example, my ninth grade stepdaughter, Sydney, she learns things constantly through YouTube. So there has to be another value and another way that we are engaging students and interacting with students because students become quite nimble and leveraging technology. This is a picture of Grace J. And Grace was, uh, she wrote an essay that was featured in Philadelphia Magazine a few months back. I'm friends with Grace's parents. And she decided after a really successful high school career at Central High School in Philly, decided to not go to college, to opt out. And so we're seeing more examples of students choosing very different directions. And we may be going much more back towards an apprenticeship model of education and much more experiential learning. But her story is one that is not um, as unique as we may have thought. So the other disrupt, so if, if we have disruptors happening in education, there are other disruptors that we need to be aware of that are, that are translating into our work environment. So if, edu if, if we need to be educating in a way that helps to prepare our students for the work environment, Newsflash, there's a lot of more disruptors that we're dealing with in the work environment. So one is healthcare. So the Affordable Care Act is completely disrupting and changing where people work, why they choose, who they're going to interview with. If you don't necessarily need to, if you will not necessarily need to take a job based on their health care package and their health insurance, that may free people up in terms of, wait for it, choosing a, a company to work for based on their values and, 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 and alignment in that way. So that leads us to this, this other new value of triple bottom line sustainability. So organizations and companies that value sustainability in terms of not only the environment, planet, but also in terms of people and in terms of profits. So social sustainability and fiscal sustainability are really critical things to think about in terms of how we're building our own organizations. Entrepreneurs are finding very new and interesting ways to start businesses and launch entrepreneurial ventures and they're circumventing traditional financial institutions. 
and there's the Internet of Things, this idea of the interconnectivity of objects through something like a Fitbit. So we will have these little wristbands that will monitor not only our heart rate and how much we're sweating, but also can monitor our home alarm system. And then finally, uh, the sharing economy. And, and there are some people who I think, um, for, for good reason, are calling the sharing economy really the gig economy, because it's not really free. There's actually um, a, a capital cost involved. But these are disruptors in the way that we work. And that means that we have to rethink power. And there were um, there's two scholars who published a great article in Harvard Business Review in December 2014, where they really looked at this idea of power. And I like the, the definition that they used. They tapped into Bertrand Russell's definition. Bertrand Russell uh, was a British philosopher. He said, power, very simply put, is the ability to produce intended effects. And I love that way of looking at power because then it's a really easy way to understand how we are empowering our students, how we empower people in the way that they work. Are we setting up platforms and structures and organizations that give them the ability to produce their intended effects? So this, is, this was the cover image of the article that was written by um, Jeremy Hymans and, and Henry Timms, and it's called Understanding New Power. And so they said the old power values look a lot like these things. So it's very heavy on authority, on managerialism, on specialization, exclusivity, um, and long-term affiliation, which frankly looks like a lot of our legacy institutions. Their research shows that new power values look much more like this. They are informal, they are open sourced, there's radical transparency, there's a value of maker culture, there's networked governance, and there's self-organization. And these things really resonated with me because a lot of my research is in how we can optimize creativity in organizations. And I've looked at that through something called improvisational organizations, and specifically through the lens of jazz music. And I'll explain more bit about that in a moment. So what we're, the shift that the Hymans and Thames are describing is a shift away from just um, overconsumption of goods and values to shifting over to co-ownership and co-producing. So if we are looking to the way we should be educating, I would submit that we really need to be figuring out how can we create environments and organizations that are allowing us to co-produce and co-own. And a term that I've been um, building out is like life. How can we develop organizations and institutions that are more like life? So that if, if I, so as a college professor, if my students are used to buying movie tickets through Fandango and streaming music and um, uh, you know, going on vacation through Airbnb, why can't they um, choose courses through an app? Why can't, why, who says a class semester has to be 16 weeks long and classes generally meet Mondays through Fridays from 8 in the morning to 6 p.m.? Who says? And how can they have input in that decision process? So all of these things are things we have to think about because we are operating in VUCA environments, environments that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And this is a term that actually comes from our US military when we first entered Afghanistan. And the, 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 the landscape was indeed a VUCA landscape. I, I blog for Inc.com on issues around design thinking and creativity. And I spoke to a friend and colleague named Heather McGowan she had given a talk in Australia at the Amplify Festival, and she had some really great um, uh, um, insights that I want to share with you. One was that when she looks at the future of work, she says that the worker's value is no longer based in what she knows, but based on the speed at which she can learn and apply. And for some of us, this is an unsettling shift. She also has said that you won't be hired based on what you've done, but what you can do. So how adaptive are you? And finally, she has stated that learning must be irrefutably lifelong. So how can we, and we're all fond of this phrase, lifelong learners, but how do we really do that and get that done? So Heather is, is, is always has wonderful um, visuals. So this is one visual she produced, which says that the old power model, the old economy, was really talking about a shift from you get educated, you get a job, and then you retire. And it's a very nice kind of stepladder look at life. This is the new reality. And this new reality for some is unsettling, for others it's really exciting, it's aspirational, right? But what she says is that you have to be able to adapt between learning, 
leveraging, and longevity. And there's a, a, this is dynamic between learning and engaging, learning and engaging. How do we get our students comfortable with, with that? I, was, I spoke um, a few weeks ago at the Mayo Clinic's Transform Conference, and there was a speaker there who gave, um, the, the Innovation Center at Mayo said, when they study the millennials, they've developed a new uh, title for millennials. They call them teacups and crispies. Teacups because some millennials have this, 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 this uh, uh, paradigm where if they get into a new situation, they shatter. They don't know what to do when things start to shift for them. So that's the teacups paradigm. The other uh, label they've started using is crispies, where they know exactly what they want to do since they were in the eighth grade. Um, and then if that doesn't work out, you know, they kind of crumble. So given those, those mindsets, how do we get them more adaptive in this way? So we need a new mindset. In my view, the mindset we need is that of creativity. But what is creativity? Um, some of us think that there are the creatives and then there are the rest of us. I don't have that viewpoint. I think all of us, part of being human is being born with this capacity for creativity. And, and so in my view, there are those of us who are working and practicing in a very robust way our creativity, and there are those of us who are not, who are just kind of sloughing it to the side. So part of what's inherent in what I'm saying is that creativity is a robust practice. It is something that you have to develop a habit for and it, and it requires a bit of grit. So, I, so in my, my research, I've divided creativity in kind of two, two dimensions. Um, one dimension is the role of intuition, which is really pattern making and pattern finding. finding. So that's that gut feeling when I think I've seen this somewhere before. And then the other aspect of creativity is improvisation, that ability to connect the dots in a very agile way between two seemingly disparate areas. And there's a temporal dimension of creativity as well as a spatial dimension. Creativity is, in my view, a chaotic system. And chaotic systems is a term that a gentleman named D. Hawk uh, developed, and I'll talk about him in a moment, but uh, I, I, I got hip to chaotic systems during my doctoral research. And a chaotic system comes out of theories of complexity, but it's this idea that we, can, we have these structures that abound in nature that we can try to reproduce in our human organizations that are this integration of chaos and order. And chaos is not anarchy. Chaos is randomness. And order is not control, order is structure. So we need both structure and randomness, and that in-between space is that chaotic system. So this is Mr. Hawk. He was the founder of Visa Card International. He, well, he, he was charged with leading Visa Card International. And Visa credit cards are this, they, they were started out to be this, co this global cooperative of self-organizing, uh, banking systems ba based on e-currency. And he was a big naturalist and he was walking through the woods one day and he said, jeepers, I've been, I've been tasked with having to develop this global credit agency and all throughout nature we have these, these self-organizing systems. Why in our human organizations do we create these hierarchies and we try to force this linear aspect, aspect in our human organizations? I'm going to try to create these organizations that are co co consisting of both chaos and order, a chaotic system. So in the forest, when a seedling falls from, the, from, a, from a leaf and lands on, on the forest floor, it self-organizes to begin to grow its own plant. And we see these self-organizing systems throughout nature. Um, our hands are considered to be holonic systems. So a holon is something that also comes out of complexity theory. It's this idea of both one and many. Um, the hand cannot exist without the palm. And it also cannot exist without the fingers. It is both one and many. And once you start getting attuned to chaotic systems, you begin to see them all over the place, and it gets to be a lot of fun. Even the way our bodies heal is this example of self-organizing emergent systems. If we, if we skin our knee, um, the, there's an ability locally to problem solve, rather than to have to get permission that, that shimmies up um, a hierarchy. So we have these networks of interdependent systems throughout nature. How do we try to build those in our human organizations? In my view, a systems view is not the solution, but it does reveal the problem. It is a means to the solution. So having stated that creativity is a system, creativity is a chaotic system, let's think of it in this way. 
creativity is not the solution, but creativity reveals the problem and creativity becomes a means to the solution. So I'm going to look, show um, uh, three ways uh, that I see this uh, exhibiting itself. And I want to also say, even though my examples are going to come from the arts, um, if we understand creativity as a chaotic system, we see creativity in science, we see creativity in business, we see creativity in technology. Um, the greatest scientists are hyper-creative because they have their ability to connect the dots between disparate areas and their ability to embrace emergent self-organizing systems. So my first example comes from jazz. I grew up in a household where my father was a jazz head. And I learned very early on as a little girl that the way I could cuddle up and really spend time with my father was when he was in his zone listening to his music. And my dad loved Horace Silver. He loved Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, and that's Art Blakey in the background on the drums. Uh, I grew up loving Dinah Washington, John Coltrane. As a Philly girl, I especially embraced John Coltrane, Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Charlie Mingus, and Count Basie. And Charlie Mingus was a bass player. My dad played the bass in the, in the Air Force, in the service. Charlie Mingus is known for having said that making the simple complicated is commonplace. We see ourselves doing this all the time. But being able to make the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. And that's something that we don't see often enough. So in my doctoral research, I worked with the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and I was trying to understand the way they design experiential services. And it, it, it emerged through my data, I'm a qualitative researcher, that people kept referencing that when things worked really well with their colleagues, things flowed, like jazz. And I, I began to discover through the help of my principal advisor that there's this whole body of literature on improvisational organizations. And there's a subset of literature on looking at organizations through the jazz lens. And Frank Barrett is an academic, he's also a jazz musician, who laid out these seven principles of the way jazz works as a chaotic system in complexity and how we can map it to our human organization. So I just want to share some examples from what I call Barrett 7. The first principle in Barrett 7 is this idea of being able to provoke competence. So if you've ever observed a jazz uh, quintet, quartet playing, there's always going to be a moment where the sax player plays a little riff and then the drummer responds or the bass player responds. And they are provoking in one another a level of competence. Let me see what you got and let me help you raise the ante. Well, what does that look like in our work, in our human organizations? Google at one time has something called a 20% time. And what they did was they allowed one of, out of every five days for their employees to tinker, to play. And out of that allowance was birthed Gmail. Now, Google no longer does their 20% time, but there are so many other organizations who have borrowed that idea of giving our, our employees some time to tinker, to play, and to provoke competence in each other. The second principle is embracing errors. In jazz, there really are no mistakes. There are only, there's only the opportunity to build on what is just done. So if you play a wrong note, you keep rolling with it. So at the Ritz-Carlton, they have actually developed a heuristic called Mr. Bibbs. It stands for mistakes, revisions, breakdowns, and efficiencies and variations. And at every meeting, in every department around the world, at every property, there's a moment where they share Mr. Bibbs. Here's a mistake that happened yesterday. Or here's something that there's a breakdown or an inefficiency that I experienced as a maid, as someone working in the boiler room. Has anyone else experienced this? And they put out this call for help through their intranet. And because of the Ritz-Carlton, they have a pretty, they incentivize people for a really nice juicy vacation and trip if you can contribute to a way to improve on that mistake. So they have figured out a way for people to not shy away from mistakes that have happened but to build on them. The third principle is this idea of minimal structures, prototyping. In a jazz composition, there can be a key that you know you're playing in, you've done an, an incredible training and practice, you know music theory, you know the scales. There's a beginning, a middle, and end. There's a, there's a minimal structure. And what happens in between that, in that chaotic system, is the magic. So what do minimal structures look like? What could they look like in our organizations? Well, those organizations that allow for prototyping are great examples. Po a pop-up shop is a prototype. Uh, Stanford's D School has experimented with pop-up classes, classes that are only going to meet for one afternoon or two afternoons. You see who's going to show up, and it's a great way to pilot 
uh, what's next. In the fashion industry, we see pop-ups all the time. Even in healthcare, Independence Blue Cross started doing this Independence uh, Blue Express truck where you could, I often saw it off of City Line Avenue and some of the strip malls, and they were trying to test new service delivery with, with uh, potential clients. Distributed tasks. In jazz, you're constantly doing your work in new environments. So Amtrak put out a call to riders a few year, a couple of years ago to have a riders residency on, on one of their train lines. And they received over 30,000 applications from riders. But can you imagine, as a rider, being able to do your riding and your work daydreaming out the window along the Pacific Coast Highway line or the Southeastern line, observing people and families interacting and what that can do for your work? Retrospective sense making. Jazz taps into the past and, histor and the historical lens in order to inform what, what, what is to come now. So the fashion industry does this all of the time. The fashion industry knows that nothing is really new. It's really about the remix and how you're, you're recombining things. The sixth principle from Barrett 7 is this idea of hanging out. So there are communities of practice in the arts and there are a lot of hallway moments. Well, an example from work organizations in the corporate world, when Pixar first developed, first designed their building, which is not so new anymore, uh, they specifically and intentionally designed their building so that the bathrooms and the water, the water fountains were in a central area where even if you worked on the fourth floor, you would have to walk all the way downstairs and pass a different range of people and hopefully have these happy accidents and conversations that you typically would not have. And the seventh principle is this idea of solo and support. This I, so that picture of Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Art Blakey was the drummer, he's the leader of that, of that trio. He was sitting in the background, he had no problem receding to the back, allowing others to shine. So where do we allow for that kind of emergent leadership in our organizations? We see this in sports all the time, and rugby is a great example of that. So this is Barrett 7, and that's my example from jazz of a chaotic system that allows for that emergence and that self-organizing. The second example I want to take from is dance. I studied dance since age four. I was very clumsy. My mother was really concerned, so she put me in dance class. And uh, one of the things I'm so grateful for about having um, been educated in dance is that even though I didn't go on to study dance, to, to perform as a professional dancer, but I danced throughout college and, and a little bit beyond, is dance taught me so much. Principally, dance taught me how to see. Because as a dance student, when you're learning choreography, you must be very intentional about movement and incorporating it into your own body. Dance taught me how to fail because you have the, of the audition process and you're constantly showing up, showing up, showing up, and finally you might be told, yes, okay, or maybe. You might be an understudy. Dance taught me how to take instruction. Dance teachers, Arguably, are some of the most evil people or teachers in the world. They do not. They do not smile when they're giving you correction, in part because they want to prepare you for the world out there. If you want to be a professional dancer, your body is your instrument, and they don't mince words. So I learned to take instruction in a very critical way, to take it in and execute next. And dance also taught me to cultivate an immense curiosity for other cultures and other people because I had to work with so many different cool people. This is a picture of Twyla Tharp, one of my favorite modern dancers. She's written a great book, which I highly recommend, actually kind of a sequel as well, but um, called The Creative Habit. And Twyla is known for having said that before you can think out of the box, you have to start with a box. What does this sound like? A chaotic system, right? You need both the structure and the randomness. And people often think, oh, creativity, improv, that's just doing what you feel like. Absolutely not. There are rules, there is structure, there's an intensive amount of practice and solitariness that goes into that practice before you see the ta-da on stage. And so what she talks about is the rigor that, and the protocols that come behind this creative endeavor. Uh, this is a photograph of Wayne McGregor, McGregor, excuse me, who's a British dancer choreographer. Um, he has a great TED talk, by the way, I highly recommend you check it out. But he calls choreography thinking in action. I became really interested in the role of the choreographer because in my view, a choreographer is a fantastic example of a systems thinker. Choreographers are engaged in a collaborative process of physical thinking. This is a group called Choreographic Figures, and they bring to the table this integration of thinking, feeling, and knowing. What if we didn't, we didn't leave feelings 
and um, knowing that intuitive sense at the door where we worked, but we integrated it in along with the rationale. And this is a collaborative between dancers, writers, and visual artists. And finally, uh, this, this, this background image is an image of uh, the, the Philodenko, uh, sorry, not Philodenko, the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. Uh, this is a performance of Revelation. Um, and the choreographer has to have this ability to both scale out very big and then scope in. Because where you rehearse may be a third of the size of the stage where you will actually perform. So the choreographer, a systems thinker, has this ability to both scale and scope, uh, to be incredible at pattern finding, because that's what you're doing. From, you have this bird's eye view mentally, and then you have to incorporate that into your dancers' bodies. You have this ability to transfer mental models, and there's a reciprocal learning, because especially in modern dance, the choreography, and even in modern ballet, the choreographic process is a co-creation process. It's this ability to work together with the dancers. And if we abstract what the choreographer is really doing, I think there's a lot that we can learn from dance. The final example I'll draw from is fashion. So I have a background in anthropology and fashion, and I collaborated with two other colleagues on um, a framework we call fashion thinking. And we've developed these workshops and um, a paradigm to help non-fashion companies understand how they might be more innovative if they think like a fashion designer. Because after all, in the United States of America, no one needs another t-shirt or another pair of jeans. Yet this is a multi-billion dollar industry. So it behooves us to just pause and try to understand how, how do fashion firms do what they do. So we developed this whole thing called fashion thinking. A lot of what they're doing is they're bringing style to the fore. So style is something that is very evident if you look at someone like Ralph Lauren logo, whether they're selling plates or sportswear or accessories. Uh, there is a very distinctive, cohesive pattern to the way they're doing what they're doing. Uh, fashion firms are completely embracing of trends. And trends, to my colleague Valerie Jacobs' view, are data from the future. Trends are not fortune telling, but it's this ability to start observing slight shifts in what's happening in the landscape and understanding how we can incorporate that into the present. And that's what fashion does very well. Fashion retailers and designers are also awesome storytellers. This is how they build in the aspirational and get us to buy that extra pair of jeans that we really didn't need. And they're really good at remixing and connecting the dots. And finally, open source sharing. So uh, fashion borrows from what we call both the elite and the street. So fashion designers are very embracing of where they can find the new by looking at subculture, um, underground clubs, youth culture, and then they'll sell it on Madison Avenue. So these three examples from jazz, from dance, and from fashion, I hope give us some, some good, robust ways of how we can translate into our schools, into the way we're educating. So that mindset that I think we need is we need to develop mindsets among our students that are much more sense makers. And sense making is actually a philosophical term. It comes from the sociologist Karl Weick uh, from his work um, in the early 90s. And so sense makers are excellent at being able to discern meaning. They have incredible observation skills, and I love hearing that because that means that we can, we can err on the side of qualitative research and empathic inquiry as long, as, in addition to uh, the rational, scientific, robust uh, frames of study. They're really good listeners. Sense makers also integrate both analytical and abductive reasoning. Subductive reasoning is this ability to tap into observations and then form theory. And then, in, so in the design thinking uh, work that, that we do in the Strategic Design MBA program, we do a lot of abductive reason, which requires you to observe, to listen, and then uh, to conclude. And finally, sense makers are excellent collaborators and incredibly integrative. All things which I hope that you saw are exhibited in the way jazz musicians work, the dance choreographer works, and the way fashion designers work. Thank you very much.